So good afternoon and very welcome. Um, good morning as well for those of you joining us from other time zones. I'm delighted uh, to see you here again for the Global Environmental Law Lecture Series, Insights from Leading Justices, Leading Courts around the world. And I'm absolutely delighted that today we've got Justice Antonio Hermann Benjamin with us, who is our speaker in this series for today, and he will provide insights on judges and biodiversity. Now I will give a short introduction into his very impressive and very um, extended uh, list of um, accomplish accomplishments in, <clears throat> in his career. I will just give you a very short overview of that and then hand over the floor. And also uh, in terms of housekeeping remarks, if you could please leave all questions in the Q&A se uh, section or in the chat function, and then we can have a discussion after the lecture finishes. Now, Justice, uh, Justice Antonio Hammer Benjamin has served as a judge of the National High Court of Brazil since 2006. At the international level, he's not only a very renowned um, um, scholar and, and professional in international environmental law, he's also served as the chair of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law and as secretary general of the UN's Environment International Advisory Council for Environmental Justice. He's the president of the Brazilian Environmental Forum of Judges and the Environmental Committee of the Summit of Chief Justices of Ibero-America. He's the lead founder and the current president of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, the organization that brings together judges from around the world who work on emerging issues in environmental law. Now, we've heard already about the work of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment and uh, several judges have uh, presented in this series. And I'm delighted that uh, we have this close collaboration that has been facilitated through Justice uh, Brian Preston, who is also a visiting professor at Durham Law School and the Durham Center for Sustainable Development Law and Policy. And I very much hope that we will continue this uh, collaboration. Um, I believe that uh, the Global Judicial Institute in particular can provide important experiences and insights and guidance also for our students, not just from the law school, but the wider university community. Now, without any further ado, I will hand over the floor to Justice Antonio Benjamin. And uh, just to let you know again, we are very much looking forward to your much anticipated lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate the University uh, of Durham and especially Professor Petra uh, Minerup for the organization of this important series of lectures on judges and the environment. I am the very last one, I believe, of, uh, of, of this series. Uh, and I'd like also to thank uh, my dear colleague and friend, uh, uh, Justice Brian Preston for being uh, uh, a liaison between the Global Judicial Institute uh, of the Environment and Durham uh, University and, and uh, Professor Petra Minerop in particular. My uh, topic today is uh, biodiversity uh, and judges. But I did include forests because I think when we speak about biodiversity, especially <clears throat> in the legal community, it is a little bit vague. And I would like to connect with, the, with, with um, uh, an entity that all of us uh, uh, are aware and, and know what it means, forest. So, <clears throat> I'll be dealing with both um, biodiversity and then with something more concrete, uh, the, the, uh, the expression of biodiversity in, uh, uh, in forest ecosystems or uh, biome. Let me see if I can move. Uh, 
Oh, yes. So I have two goals here. As you all know, this is not an in-depth uh, presentation. It's too vast in law and science and other areas of knowledge involved with biodiversity and forest. And here we can only give an overview of some of the key uh, issues and aspects in this area. Of course, uh, those key issues and features depend on, on uh, whomever is speaking. Uh, it's, I had to select some of those uh, the points, but the main uh, goals are two. Uh, one is to look at biodiversity and forests from a legal perspective, but not from an international law perspective, more from a comparative law uh, overview. And within that, uh, try to identify uh, some major objectives, principles, and instruments. Again, this is just an overview. In the second part, to connect what I will say in the first part with the role of judges in both adjudicating, uh, let me say, environmental law cases, and second, environmental law cases that deal with biodiversity and forest. I think it's useful to begin with a map. Maps are visual. So here you have the forest biomes in the world. And I would say the biodiversity biomes of the world, of course, biodiversity is everywhere from the Arctic to Antarctica. But my focus here today is on biodiversity in forest ecosystems and biomes. And I'll be focusing more on those forests close to the equator. In other words, I'll be focusing more on tropical forests. And the reason for doing this is because in tropical forests, we have one, the so-called biodiversity hotspots of the world, in addition to coral reefs in the oceans. Second, we have the most uh, massive deforestation in the world. And third, we have the weakest institutional systems for the protection of biodiversity and forest. And of course, when we say institutional frameworks, we include judges as well. I should perhaps say, just to give you an example, that one hectare of Atlantic forest in Brazil has more species of plants than the temperate forest of Europe. This is an indication of how relevant those tropical forests and subtropical forests are uh, if we really want um, to examine them from a biodiversity uh, perspective. Now, another map, I will be showing only two maps. If you look at this map, it shows the areas of massive deforestation. And in South America, you have the Amazon, but also in Central America as well, Yucatan province, this little finger, which is in fact a big finger in, in Mexico. Then, uh, deforestation in the Congo Basin, uh, 
also in 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 Mozambique in the in the, in southeast Africa and and then of course in Asia and the Pacific there is also deforestation in the temperate forests in the north but as I said uh, in terms of that diversity of plants and wildlife and other living organisms, there is no way to compare uh, those uh, different uh, biomes. Uh, therefore, I'll be focusing more, I repeat myself, on uh, the, uh, the areas of the map where you have uh, tropical forests. Let's move now to something that I call golden rules. This slide could be much longer. Golden rules, not just golden legal rules, but golden rules from a rational perspective, just good sense when we are dealing as legal profession with biodiversity and forests, especially tropical forests. The first golden rule is to understand the complexity of biodiversity and forests. In a lecture like this, I mentioned biodiversity, I mentioned forest, but in fact, there is a package that comes with those two core concepts, biodiversity on one side and forest on, on the other side. We don't have to, uh, the time to explore this complexity. We will just be touching the surface of some uh, relevant aspects of those uh, two pillars of life on earth. The second golden rule that again can apply from science, ethics, all the way to law and judges is keep them, restore them and enrich them and expand them. This has deep legal consequences that we are going to discuss in the next few slides. To keep them, meaning to conserve them. And then the distinction between conservation and preservation, restore them when they are damaged, destroyed, enrich them when they have been depleted, and expand them because in some parts of the world, forests have been so diminished that they don't provide an adequate habitat for the wildlife, for example, that depends on, on that habitat. Third, identify critical habitats and endangered species. This is not necessarily the role of judges, but judges depend on this identification of critical habitats and endangered species. As we are going to see in a minute, some special legal re regimes are developed to protect critical habitats and endangered species, the so-called listed species. And finally, in this short list, but as I, I warned before, this list is much longer, avoid the complete destruction of habitat and extinction of species. When you destroy a forest, and leave very little of the 
original habitat, it's very difficult to restore or even to enrich or expand that forest. And then biodiversity will disappear once the habitat has, has disappeared. So if the judge has to act, it has, the judge has to act first to prevent using preventive measures, but also precautionary measures, the damage. If it arrives a little bit late to mitigate and stop the damage. And finally, if, it, if the judge arrives really late, it will be problematic for a meaningful judgment to bring back uh, uh, the species that were lost. If there is no seed bank, natural seed bank left or very little of that the original complexity, let me repeat the first, complexity of that forest in place that would be then used to uh, restore what, what was illegally um, uh, lost. There is a one complication here that we, I think we are going uh, to come back uh, to that if we have time. It's the fact that as opposed to temporary forests and habitats, we don't know everything that is in tropical forests. Even the ones that we think we know a lot about them, for example, the Atlantic forest or the forests in Australia, every day new species of plants and animals, wildlife, are being discovered, even primates. So this shows that we might be losing something that we don't even know that it exists to, to begin with. Now let's move to the roles of biodiversity and forests. And one might ask, Wow, why is this important for judges? It is important for judges because the first question that a judge should ask, not just in environmental law, not just in biodiversity law, not just in forest law, but in any legal field, is before that human conflict that is before her or him, what are the values that are protected by the legal system? That's the beginning. But normally we don't ask this question in other fields of law. In environmental law, however, the legislator from the very beginning, the late 70s and 80s and 90s in some countries, the legislators have been careful to include in the statutes protecting either the environment in general or elements of the environment, the values that should be considered. And we see ethical values, religious values, static values, ecological values, the climate system, this is more recent, soil and water protection, this is the most ancient uh, component, economic <clears throat> values, again, this is also ancient uh, in the UK, for example, uh, historical, and I mentioned here one that I, I, I really like, comes from China, in one of the statutes protecting biodiversity and forest, it's listed a revolutionary commemoration. So forests 
or habitats that uh, have historical relevance because it's connected to Mao's revolution and, and the political system um, that uh, exists nowadays in, in China. National defense, road safety, those are just some of the, the values and they become legal values and more and more constitutional values that are uh, incorporated in the legal system that protects biodiversity and forests. Finally, in this slide, it's important to stress that those values are not static. If we go to the 19th century legislation protecting forests, for example, in Germany, a pioneer uh, in, in forest legislation, all the way back to the 18th century, or in more fragmented manner in, in England, uh, beginning with the period of the Magna Carta and the Carta on Forests, we are going to see that the values that we have nowadays were not present there. And new values were added, and more recently, uh, climate change. This means that judges have to be careful when identifying the, the values that are in the legislation, because it is possible that new values recognized by the legal system that are applicable to either forest or biodiversity are not in that particular statute, but in other statutes. And then we have to do what, um, you know, uh, extraordinary um, German scholar, Eric James calls the dialogue of sources. So if we think that's already complicated for judges to apply environmental laws and, and statutes that you, for example, with forest, a forest cult, you can add more complication saying, I'm sorry, um, Excellency, you have also to look at the whole legal system and identify values that are now incorporated, not directly, but indirectly in the specialized micro legal system that deals with forests and biodiversity. The next slide is on something that to me is absolutely crucial. It's a pity and we should criticize ourselves that environmental law scholars talk about environmental law and they don't begin with the fundamental question of property rights. In fact, environmental law exists as a reaction to the abuse practice that came from law and from judges in respect to property rights. So it is important that we discuss in dealing with biodiversity and forest, the issue of ownership and also the evolving new principles that are legal principles that apply to both biodiversity and, and force. And let's begin with this topic and within it with a distinction that should be emphasized between biodiversity and forest ownership. Biodiversity is something that is intangible. It has material representation, wildlife, um, flora, etc., etc. It has levels 
that are stated in the Biodiversity Convention of 1992, all the way to genetic diversity. But it's not the same type of forest, I'm sorry, of property narrative that we see in forest ownership because it's a new concept. You don't find biodiversity or biological diversity in statutory provisions before the 70s or even before the 90s. The term didn't exist. The concept, yes, but not the term. And in terms of ownership, it's much more complex than forest ownership because the legal system, including civil codes, Germany and Brazil in this case, share um, the civil law system. We are part of it, but even in common law, in ancient English law, we find legal uh, regimes for force. What I can say here, moving uh, and, and making perhaps um, a dialogue between biodiversity, forests, and wildlife, and we could move all the way to genetic uh, diversity, but we don't have the time, is that for forests, the general rule is that the owner of the land, the owner of the forest. So if the owner of the land is private, an individual, the forest in most legal systems will be private. If the owner is communal, the forest will probably be communal. And if the owner is the state or the crown, the forest, the owner of the land, the forest will probably be uh, the state or belong to the state or to the crown. This applies differently to wildlife because wildlife moves. Of course, nowadays we know that forests and vegetation moves too in a different manner and in a different pace. So we might have private property of forests and state or crown property of the wildlife. And then if we want to add complexity, we might have mixed systems of private ownership with rights that belong either through statutory determination or contractual relationship to other people or other persons or even other communities or even the state. And I mentioned conservation easements. A whole new world is what we call ecosystem service generated by biodiversity and forests. And the system is still evolving for ownership. And one of the aspects, to me, one of the most important aspects is how we include indigenous peoples in, in this dialogue of biodiversity and forest ownership and including ecosystem service generated by those ecosystems. Later on, in a few minutes, I will mention the ecological function of property rights. In other words, we might have private land 
private forest or private components of biodiversity, but those property rights are tied to an ecological function that limits the use of the or the bundle of rights that in common law we associate with a property. Now, the objectives of national legislation. I said that this would be a comparison among legal systems, national legal systems, not uh, a talk on the international law dimension of biodiversity, the Biodiversity Convention and, and other international agreements, or forest. We don't have an international agreement as a convention on forests. The focus is on national legislation. The traditional objective, the ancient objective, if I may say so, is in the case of forest, they use for timber. And we find laws about timber and forest since Babylonian times. And then ancient, but much later, another objective evolved, not directly linked to forest, but a, a result, a consequence, of the protection of forest, namely the fact that forest can avoid or mitigate erosion. And soil fertility is something that has always been at the forefront of the values of farming. And we see this erosion control component in most forest legislation in the world. The present objectives here are related to a change in perspective. So forests don't have just one or two main objectives, which would demand legal protection and judicial intervention, forests are recognized as, as having multiple functions, including the protection of biodiversity. That's the ecological um, word that is mentioned there. And more and more, because timber is now in many parts of the world, dependent on planted forest, eucalyptus, pinus, and so on, the main function becomes the ecological one. So forest as, perhaps I could say, the garden of Eden of biodiversity because of the number of species that depend on forest ecosystems. There are a number of legislative models. I would like just to highlight a few uh, aspects of those uh, legal systems, and then we move to judges. One possibility of protecting biodiversity and forests is through the so-called, or at least that's the way I call it, the comprehensive model. We see that in, in countries, in different parts of the world that enact a biodiversity act or a forest act or both. A second model 
And let me say that those models co coexist. It's area-based protection. So instead of protecting species, areas, large areas are protected, taking into consideration key elements. So we have national parks, national forests, and so on. Third, in some countries, we find the protection of whole biomes. For example, legislation protecting biodiversity and vegetation of mangroves. Or a particular forest biome, a law protecting the Brazilian Atlantic forest. Another avenue that legislators take it to, is to protect not all forests in a region, but some types of forests. For example, forests above a specific altitude. And the reasons vary because they are, they, they are more, more fragile because of their importance in protecting water sources and, and so on. Another type of model is the protection of species. And this exists pretty much all over the world. Listing of endangered species, or protected species, regulation of commerce and use, and protection of individual trees. In some cases, a national tree. In other cases, trees that have religious purpose. There is great variation in that. And finally, I'll stop here with those legislative models. I could continue. Criminal civil and administrative liability. And a big issue in respect to the protection of biodiversity and, and forests is how we calculate the natural resource damage. So damage, not just in terms of timber, but in terms of the ecosystem service that we referred a minute ago. And all this uh, would require a full course, not just one lecture uh, because of uh, I would not say it's cutting edge because there is so much knowledge about it, but the complexity, especially the complexity for judges. Finally, let's move to judges. In the protection of biodiversity and forests. I believe it's important to open this with a statement that seems obvious, but in law, what is obvious needs to be repeated. We need to be reminded of what is obvious. And the obvious statement is that judges are protectors of biodiversity and forests. Not because they want, but because both constitutional and, and other norm legislators have decided that 
judges should protect biodiversity and forests. And they do this in, in several ways. First, when legislators establish rights and obligations that are directly linked to biodiversity and forest. And you know, if you use rights and obligations, duties, discourse, this is the key to open the judicial system. Second, because often we see norms that establish judicial procedures for judges to deal with environmental cases. In many parts of the world, not so much in Latin America, but in Asia, for example, in the Philippines, in China, in Indonesia, the courts themselves, the Supreme Court, or the top judicial authority, could be a council, a judicial council, establish rules and priorities that judges should observe in dealing with environmental cases. Another point that I would like to stress, and I have already alluded to this point, is that the main role of judges is not in their traditional liability responsibilities. The main role of judges here is to act in a preventive and precautionary manner. Again, this could be just good sense, wisdom, but it's determined by law. Judges still deal with restoration, ecological compensation, financial payments, et cetera, et cetera, but that comes second. And the whole system, those measures, preventive, precautionary, restoration, and so on, compensation, depend on a system of legal principles that judges use in order to make the system coherent. In other times, in order to get from those principles an answer that the legal system in itself cannot provide. Let me mention a few of those legal principles that are directly applicable. Those are the so-called new principles that are directly applicable to the protection of biodiversity and in particular forest. The indubio pro natura principle. There is a lot. Uh, uh, perhaps I should not say a lot, but there is uh, um, growing literature on that. And I suggest um, that you look on the site of the World Commission on Environmental Law or the precedents uh, that are can be found in um, in the portal, in the judicial portal of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment and UNAM. The second one, the principle of ecological functional property right, I already mentioned. It means that the bundle of rights and come together with a bundle of obligations. And one of them being the ecological function of property. This derives from the social function inherent to property rights, 
uh, that comes all uh, that goes all the way back to the Weimar Constitution and before the Weimar Constitution to the uh, the Mexican Constitution of the beginning of the 20th century. The principle of property and nature of environment obligations, meaning that those obligations attach to the land. So when it's transmitted, sold, inherited by somebody else, the obligations that derive from illegal deforestation that happened before come together with the rights of enjoyment of that property. And this is very, very important in order to avoid either the defense of no causation. Oh, I'm sorry, I bought this property yesterday, but it was cleared 10 years ago. Or the defense of the statute of limitation. I bought it 10 years ago, but the statute of limitation has run. So the principle of property realm nature of environmental obligation stops, so to speak, uh, or at least mitigates the statute of limitation that is, uh, has such a, a powerful and negative impact in deforestation. Well, this concludes my, my, my presentation. I'm now happy to answer a few questions uh, and let me know if there are questions. Thank you so much, uh, Justice Benjamin. That was a very comprehensive and insightful lecture, an uh, excellent overview. And I really like the idea of tying in uh, forest and forest protection. Um, while we are waiting for uh, some questions to be typed into the chat or into the Q&A section, that normally takes a while to break the ice, I'm more than happy to ask a question if I'm allowed. Um, I, I thought it was um, extremely timely, especially in the light of the um, declaration of leaders at COP26 on the protection of forests and uh, land use, 145 countries signing up, covering almost 90% uh, or so of, of forestry land. Um, so as a judge, uh, how would you evaluate this? I mean, I, I, you know, we all know this is not a legal instrument in that sense that it is legally binding and so on. But um, would it give you some kind of additional leeway to reason in a certain way or to interpret statutory laws in a certain way or what do you think is the um apart from a political effect perhaps a legal value of this well thank you uh, first of all i think we should be careful when we say that something that is signed by the international community has no no legal implication we know the difference between hard, soft international uh, law and everything else. But in environmental law, what we have is often the soft environmental law instruments being more cited by judges than the hard international agreements. For example, there is very little citation of the Biodiversity Convention or the Convention on Biological Diversity of 1992. Often because judges don't know much about it. And there are hundreds, thousands of citations of the Stockholm Declaration and the Rio Declaration. Or even agreements that uh, or documents that have not been negotiated. Like for example, the 2018 Brazilian Declaration of Judges on Water Justice. Judges from around the world 
got together, draft that declaration, and as soon as it was published, it began being cited by Supreme Courts of around the world. And one might say, well, this is a violation of the precepts of international law. Is it? So it, it is allowed for a judge, let's say from Brazil, to cite uh, a 19th century legal scholar from Germany or from the UK, but not to cite, not as a main ref legal reference, but uh, 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 as an argument of persuasion, of legal persuasion, uh, documents that have been uh, uh, signed and, and published by uh, the world community. So there is a contradiction here. Um, judges cite, in, with exception nowadays, of the United States, but all over the world, judges cite comparative legal literature. And it doesn't matter if it's a case in civil law, the judge can cite doctrines from common law, something that was written um, decades ago or just yesterday. But the judge cannot uh, take into consideration uh, those le uh, legal, although not binding, arguments uh, spelled out in in uh, uh, in, in international um, uh, documents, as uh, the one that uh, that you mentioned. Now, reply specifically to your question. It's important to realize that often what is being stated at the international level is less than what countries already have in their national legal systems. And they are not complying with what exists within the national legal framework. At the end of the day, the issue is, is one about political will, and enforcement of national laws. And I, I mentioned the case of Brazil. We have laws that protect 80% of the Amazon, not 20%, not 5%, but 80% of the Amazon. Bhutan has in its constitution a uh, provision that protects 60% of the forest coverage of the country. Therefore, the protection is already there. What we need is action and implementation. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just looking. I think I can't see anything in the Q&A uh, section. I, I have a, a different question, but just to follow up, uh, I, I absolutely agree. Just because okay. something so happened. perhaps we could we could end in four minutes because this would uh, then allow me to um, to continue with my my other work, the main work. <laughs> Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I just uh, wanted to add that I agree that just because something hasn't been you know, ratified in the sense of an international agreement doesn't mean that it doesn't have any legal force. But I, th I still think that the Stockholm Declaration and also RIA are slightly different, perhaps, because there was the General Assembly asking uh, for a working group to be established. And then also there was this confirmation afterwards of, of the outcome of these conferences, major conferences, whereas this Forest Declaration was really hailed as a success of the presidency here in the UK at least for COP26 uh, but it seems to have not been anywhere acknowledged since then so it's really almost um, in that sense counterproductive I think um, if, if it hasn't you know any kind of scope in, in the legal or political world. Um, um, I mean, given that you would like to, to end here, just a final question. How would you integrate um, the principle of intergenerational equity into, you know, the, your last slide where you had the different principles? How would you integrate that? Well, in the last slide, I only mentioned um, 
the most recent still evolving legal principle. Uh, in environmental law, the principle of um, uh, intergenerational uh, equity is probably the most established one with uh, the principle of prevention. Um, and and at, at least in, 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 in case law, we see that used all the time. And intergenerational equity goes all the way back to the 19th century. If you um, uh, read uh, the act that established the national parks in the United States, it already mentioned um, uh, not inter intergenerational equity with that terminology, but it mentioned future generations yeah. or our descendants. So the language, it uh, uh, might be different, but the concept, and it's a powerful one, um, uh, to that what we are protecting, it's not just us, but um, uh, the generation, uh, the generations to come. This has huge implications in, in law, in all areas of law, of environmental law. And we have to realize that it's not just in environmental law. Uh, the protection of... Um, uh, historical heritage, for example, is another area of law in which uh, intergenerational equity plays uh, an important uh, role. The same thing about um, education law. Uh, we might say, well, we, you know, the victims are those that are not having education. No, no, we are uh, causing damage to future, uh, to future generations. It's a domino uh, effect. Uh, in, in, uh, at least in my part of the world, in Latin America, it's the exception is for judgments, not to mention international, intergenerational equity and intragenerational equity. Uh, it's the opposite. Um, uh, so most cases do mention intergenerational equity. That's why I said, uh, and I was speaking from the perspective of my part of the world that we, uh, this is one of the most well-established and almost taken for granted. Uh, there are, there are uh, of course, uh, legal arguments against uh, intergenerational uh, equity, but I don't think it's the point of this uh, conversation here to go uh, into uh, into that, I think it's enough uh, to to state that it's um, um, it's considered as part of the core of environmental law in many parts of, of the world. But it's not enough, and this leads us to something else: Are we protecting just humans uh, when we say? Uh, intergenerational equity, or are we protecting, as you, the Constitution of Germany, as you know, uh, Professor Minerop, um, talks about the foundations of life. If we are protecting the foundations of life, then the next question is, are we protecting the foundations of life in separation uh, or in themselves? as opposed to us humans. And if we are protecting them um, and identifying those foundations of life independently, or at least in an autonomous manner, what type of changes are we prepared to do in the legal systems? And do we need to make those changes in the legal system when, for example, you have already changes in terms of broadening up the, the gates of courts in terms of standing to sue. But again, this is for another conversation, not for today. Absolutely, I agree. So there's so much to follow up and uh, it's uh, now time to wrap this up. And thank you again for your extremely insightful uh, lecture. And uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. There is now one 
remark in the queue. No, it just says thank you again very much for your fantastic lecture. Thank you, Judith. Uh, so with that, we will end here for today, but this is to be continued. So thank you again very much. And we thank will you very much for the invitation and for the, the global environmental law in dialogue with the judiciary series. Thank you.